came together to do this book, we, um, we met at a couple of conferences and we actually really started talking after I gave a presentation on some earlier work I had done on refugee resettlement. And Jeff came up to talk to me afterwards to tell me about all the things he disagreed with in my presentation. Uh, and the reason Jeff and I disagree sometimes is I think simply because of the fact that I come from a background in law and he comes from political science. And so we th see things slightly differently. But when we started talking, we were talking about refugees and resettlement at a time when Canadians started talking more about refugees and resettlement. And this was in late 2015, early 2016, when the Syrian um, crisis was really at a, a point, a high point, and both the Canadian government and Justin Trudeau's promise to sponsor, to resettle 25,000 Syrian refugees and Canadians coming into private sponsorship were interested in refugee sponsorship in bringing over more refugees. And so what refugee sponsorship is for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, uh, who's with us tonight, refugee sponsorship is meant to be an additional way to resettle refugees. So the government of Canada has a commitment to resettle refugees. They do this voluntarily. Countries can opt to resettle refugees if they want to. There is no legal obligation. So it is different from the commitment that governments have to asylum seekers who come and claim refuge in a country. In order to supplement that, when you're in a country like Canada that is quite far from refugee flows, you can opt as a country to bring in further refugees as resettlement, uh, through resettlement. In Canada, from the beginning, uh, and even previous to the beginning, earlier, prior to any formal laws about it, individual Canadians have come together to say, we want to bring more people over to protection. And this has been formalized in our law through a program called private refugee sponsorship. And what this means is that Canadians commit to bringing together the money and all the requirements to bring a family or individuals to Canada and to support them during their first year in lieu of the government offering those supports. So that's the basic model of the program and it's operated in Canada for now over 40 years. It really sort of took on its um, vibrancy after during the Indochinese crisis in the 1970s and has worked in and out of different flows ever since that time. But in 2015, 2016, more Canadians started talking about private sponsorship and resettlement because they were talking about the Syrian conflict. And when Jeff Cameron and I were talking, one of the awarenesses we had was that in talking about Syrian resettlement and talking about private sponsorship in this moment, where suddenly lots of Canadians who'd never sponsored before were suddenly interested in sponsoring, we were missing that broader history of what Canada's private sponsorship program looked like and what that meant and what were some of the particular cases, challenges, contexts of that model. And at the same time, we were conscious that Canada, while it was doing the Syrian resettlement, was also looking to encourage other countries to take up the sponsorship model that Canada had essentially created. And so what Jeff and I decided to do was we decided to put out a call for paper papers and we said, let's see who we can get around Canada and around the world who is talking about refugee sponsorship, who is interested in writing a chapter for us about something to do with refugee sponsorship so that we can put a book together that puts in lots of different perspectives on the model. And we got lots of submissions and we picked a wide variety of them and we all gathered in Toronto uh, to have an initial conference to talk about our ideas. And from that, this is our product. So from that little idea, from that actual disagreement that Jeff and I had, um, and a wonderful call for paper that was well received by lots of brilliant people from different perspectives, we have this book. And this book is, I haven't even, I don't even know how many pages it is. It's a, it's a little under 400 pages. It has 16 chapters and it has 31 authors in total. So it's a very big book with lots of different ideas and a wealth of information in it. And tonight I'm so lucky that I've been joined by three of these authors. And each of these authors really give different perspectives on the book. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce each of them. 
And then I'm going to ask them each to give you a little synopsis of their chapter of the book, what they're talking about. And then we have a total of four questions that I'm going to ask them and we're going to reflect upon and we're going to talk about and we'll open it to Q&A uh, throughout if you want to ask some questions while we go along or at the end to sort of explore some of these ideas. I'm used to using Zoom uh, to do my courses and my seminar lectures right now. So this is going to sort of operate for me like that. I'm sure there's some students in the classroom in the room right now who are very familiar with the style. It's going to be pretty um, flowing and I'm sitting here at my dining room table. Fortunately, my husband took my children to the lake, so no one is going to disturb us tonight. Um, and that's the plan. So what I want to do first is just introduce my panelists from the book who joined us tonight. So the first panelist who's joined us is coming from Nova Scotia tonight. This is Rachel McNally. And Rachel is a PhD student in political science at Carleton University. When she was first submitting her chapter to this, she was working on her master's. Um, and she's had brilliant ideas for years and years, and she continues to impress me with all her energy and commitment. So she's a PhD student in political science at Carleton University. And her research is focusing on refugee resettlement and sponsorship. And she's also a project officer with LEARN, L-E-R-R-N, the Local Engagement Refugee Research Network. Uh, our next presenter and author from the book is Dr. Craig Damien Smith. Uh, Craig is coming to us from Toronto, and he's a senior research associate at the Canada Excellence Research Chair, CERC in Migration and Integration at Ryerson University. And his research focuses on global migration governance, irregular migration, and refugee integration. And then our final panelist who's coming to us from Victoria, which is where I used to live and it's probably warmer than Winnipeg today, uh, is Dr. Sabine Lair, who is the private sponsorship of refugees manager at the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria. And she's currently serving as the chair of the Canadian Refugee Sponsorship Agreement Holders Associations Council. So what you can see from these panelists is they're all bringing a wealth of experience to the discussion tonight that really extends beyond the particular chapters they wrote for our book. And so some of what they will say will reflect on their chapters and some will just come from their greater um, and immense knowledge of these issues. So we've got, we've got a lot for you tonight. So with those brief introductions and a little bit of context, I really wanna give uh, my panelists time to talk. So what I'm going to do first is just ask them to each individually give you a sense of what their chapter was about. And to do this, we're going to start sort of as the chapters flow in the book uh, with Sabine. So Sabine, I'm going to hand it to you now if you want to tell us a bit about your chapter. Sure. Thank you very much, Shauna, for the introduction. And uh, also thank you to the CIC for hosting us here tonight and having an interest in this topic. Um, welcome and good evening to all of uh, the people that are here in attendance. I've, I've seen a couple of names that I know. I know that at least one of my sponsors is there. So that's wonderful. So the, the book chapter that uh, I contributed with my co-author, Brian Dick from the Mennonite Central Committee, deals with the concept of of naming refugees in the Canadian uh, private sponsorship program. Naming is a, a foundational principle of this program and it is really an informal term for sponsor referred, which describes a feature of the Canadian sponsorship program that is still fairly unique really in the world. And that is the ability of ordinary Canadians to refer to the Canadian government, those refugees that they wish to sponsor. Um, even though several countries have recently started community sponsorships or thinking about it, and you will hear more about this tonight from one of my co-panelists. Um, what remains really special about the Canadian program is that naming ability. Most other countries um, that have adapted the, adopted these schemes recently rely on resettlement referrals from partner agencies. So very often the UN Refugee Agency, but also some others. And then those referrals, they are being matched with sponsors in those countries. And the reason why this naming or sponsor referral is important is because many resettled refugees, whether they come through sponsorship or whether they come through the government um, assisted program, leave other family members behind in difficult situations. So community 
community sponsorship um, thus becomes an important avenue for newcomers themselves and for to reunite with their families, with their loved ones that they have left behind and that are also living lives as refugees. We call that also here in Canada the, the echo effect. And I think that's a term that's also kind of taking hold uh, in other parts of the world. So in, in our book chapter, um, Brian and I are providing an overview of how naming exactly became enshrined in the Canadian program. We, we look at some of the contestations around the inclusion of that concept and highlight some of the intended and also unintended consequences of naming. And we also explain how um, the outcomes from naming that are being observed now in, in mature programs, such as the Canadian one, could possibly serve as design elements in the newer programs. So to illustrate that point, we, we provide the example in particular of faster integration outcomes and more diversity um, in the resettlement population, which are both outcome indicators that have been observed here in Canada. And as other countries are looking at designing their own programs, they may wish to uh, consider those indicators in, in their program design. So in the chapter, we also um, discuss the complex relationship between that naming principle and another foundational principle of the Canadian sponsorship program. And this is known as uh, additionality. And I think we'll hear more about this tonight for those that are unfamiliar with it. But what it means is it refers to those private sponsorship programs leading to additional protections, uh, protection spaces for refugees over and above what governments provide. Um, we show in the chapter how naming can both strengthen additionality, but it can also call its meaning into question when the number of privately sponsored refugees starts exceeding those refugees that are being resettled by the government. And this is currently actually the case here in Canada. So ultimately, uh, towards the end of our chapter, we argue that the question of whether to allow such naming or not is an important consideration for all the newer countries, the newer players and in community sponsorship. They must weigh uh, different objectives uh, of sponsorship, such as the desire for providing humanitarian protection for those that are most in need with other objectives like family reunification. And in Canada, of course, this is, uh, this is enshrined in the uh, Immigration Refugee Protection Act. So family reunification is explicitly mentioned there for refugees. And we end our chapter by saying that whichever route new countries decide to take, the pressure for naming will become a reality for them because it will be ultimately exerted by the resettled refugees themselves who over time will be become a force that those countries will cannot ignore and they will be asking for naming because they will want to bring their family members. So I'll leave it at this for now and uh, we'll talk later. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating chapter and just giving, giving specific numbers to some of what was said. The current plans for Canadian resettlement, which are of course currently paused somewhat because of the COVID pandemic, put private sponsorship numbers at double government resettlement numbers. So the intentions for the years going forward are about 20,000 privately sponsored refugees per year and 10,000 government. So you see the power of that naming. Um, one of the things the government really did in sort of response to this tension was create a new model of sponsorship in 2013. And that's what Rachel's chapter sort of speaks about. So I'm gonna give it to you now, Rachel. So hello everyone. Um, so my chapter is essentially a case study of the blended visa office referred program. So that's a big bureaucratic way of um, saying it, but essentially it's two things. It's a matching mechanism. Um, so it's a program that takes refugees that are referred by the UNHCR um, and are approved by Canadian visa offices. Um, then those refugees go onto a list and sponsors can then choose refugee families from that list. So that's called the BVOR list. Um, and it's also a cost sharing arrangement. So it um, splits the cost of sponsoring a refugee between the government and private sponsors. So it was introduced in 2013, but it's really only the latest in a series of blended initiatives that have combined um, matching mechanisms with cost sharing arrangements. And so my chapter is a case study of this program, um, but especially of this program in the context of rural Nova Scotia. And so my chapter essentially has three arguments. So first of all, 
Um, during the Syrian initiative, which was a time of high public interest and sponsorship, this particular model, the BVOR model, served as an effective tool to mobilize new sponsors, including sponsors in rural areas. Um, and Nova Scotia is one example of a place where many sponsors in smaller communities um, decided to become involved in refugee sponsorship and did so through this BVOR model. Um, and nearly 4,000 Syrians arrived through this program between 2015 and 2017, as well as hundreds of refugees from other countries. And second, my chapter talks about how there's a lot of potential for rural sponsorship um, that is not always recognized and refugees can benefit from some of the opportunities um, with settling in a rural area. However, there are also challenges to rural sponsorship that need to be taken seriously. For example, limited settlement services or limited or non-existent public transit. Um, and then third, it talks about how despite the many potential benefits of this model, um, it has struggled to remain sustainable. So both before and after this surge of sponsorship during the Syrian initiative. And so there are many re different reasons for this sustainability, um, these issues with sustainability. And one of them is linked to um, what Sabina was saying in her chapter about naming is the question, BVOR is a program where Canadians sponsor strangers. Um, whereas the private sponsorship program, um, they're sponsoring people they know primarily, um, primarily family members or relatives. So there's this built-in incentive because you're picking the person you want to sponsor, whereas BVOR is different. You're picking someone off a list that you never have met before. And so that's one of the challenges. And ultimately this question of sustainability raises concerns both within Canada and beyond because this is the model that is being promoted to other countries. Um, as this successful public-private partnership and also as the model that other countries should follow when they're creating their own private sponsorship programs. And so if we want to make sponsorship contribute to refugee protection in a lasting way, um, we need to figure out how to build models that will be sustainable beyond this particular crisis moment. So I'll leave it at that for now. That's great. Thank you, Rachel. And I think um, both Rachel and Sabina's presentations really speak to what, Gra what Craig's going to speak about. And I'll just add that when we did our call for papers um, and had our conference, Craig wasn't part of that, but we had our conference at the Monk School and he happened to be working there and sat in on some of the presentations. And I think by the end of the first day, he said, I, I think I want to write a chapter for us. This And it worked out really well because his chapter really speaks to the other end of everything we're discussing today. So with that, Craig, I will give it to you. Uh, thank you very much, Shimana and, and, the, and CIC for having me and thank you for allowing me into the book. Um, so my chapter is uh, titled A Model for the World? Question mark. Policy Transfer Theory and the Challenges to Exporting Private Sponsorship to Europe. Um, so it uses lessons from uh, what's called policy transfer theory from political science to explain why Canada's uh, what's called the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative or the GRSI was unable to export private sponsorship to Europe despite very significant financial and political weight behind it and why it then scaled down in those very ambitious goals to providing mostly technical support and capacity building to pre-existing community support models in Europe, in a few European states. And, and I worry sometimes that it comes off as, as too critical, uh, but in the chapter I offer, or try to offer some pathways for learning from the Canadian experience while toning down uh, the hubris a little bit. And that's behind a lot of the way that Canadians see themselves in the world. At least that's my analysis. So uh, as a bit of background, the GRSI emerged at that time when the Trudeau government was riding very high on the international prestige for resettling Syrian refugees. And it's through its weight behind uh, the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants in 2016, which then led to the two global compacts on migration and refugees. that announced a very early contribution and tangible contribution through the GRSI. Um, <clears throat> its stated goal was to export the private sponsorship model to Europe and provide a model for the world to expand what's called responsibility sharing in the international refugee regime. Um, at that time, John McCallum, the Trudeau government's first immigration minister, liked to talk about how he was the only immigration minister in the world 
who was criticized for admitting too few refugees. Um, but that kind of observation, again, it, it's, only, it's only surprising from like a, like a very sheltered Canadian perspective. Um, because also like going on at the same time was the, was the, the, the ending of the, the refugee crisis in Europe when a million people were showing up in Europe. So the goals of exporting the private sponsorship model met a very mixed reception from policymakers and politicians in Europe, and it hasn't yet resulted in any additional resettlement to Europe. Um, and I argue in the chapter that the, that that export project was based on a faulty premise that the private sponsorship model in Canada was readily transferable to other contexts. And the rest of the volume illustrates very comprehensively that the Canadian private sponsorship model's existence is based on this long and kind of mutually constitutive and interdependent relationship between the history of immigration, the history of private sponsorship, and then support for large-scale immigration and humanitarian um, humanitarian immigration models and resettlement, so asylum and resettlement, and that Canada, because it's far away from refugee generating or refugee sending regions, can select who comes. And so all of that is mixed together in the history and in Canadian multiculturalism, et cetera, in a way that allows private sponsorship to exist, but also to change over time. But Europe obviously is a very different place. And it launched at the time when uh, European states were closing their borders, were burden shifting with one another. And the European project, if you believe Angela Merkel and the heads of all the European institutions, was about to collapse because too many people were coming. So at that moment, attempting to export private sponsorship to Europe, which I explained through some jargony uh, political science type theory, that, which has good evidence behind it, um, was basically the worst time to do this and that the, can, that the GRSI could not offer the positive incentives that were necessary to overcome the very high uh, adoption and compliance costs that would be necessary in Europe to take on a new model of bringing more refugees when the entire political spectrum was turning against refugees. I can get to the less pessimistic stuff in the Q&A. Perfect, thank you. So we're gonna move exactly to the less pessimistic stuff because now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask some questions to the panelists um, and have them each sort of come in and I might give some of my own reflections. But again, if you really want the details, you will have to buy the book. Um, and with these questions, I'll remind you that you can use the Q&A function. If you have questions you wanna follow up on, please send them that way and then I can ask those to the panelists as well. But the first question and Rachel, I'm gonna put it to you first is from your perspective in the book, so thinking about your chapter, what is the strongest argument in support of continued or expanded refugee sponsorship in Canada and, as Craig started to talk about, elsewhere? Yeah, so I think for me, um, sponsorship involves people and groups and communities who would not otherwise be involved in welcoming refugees. So for example, rural communities do not have government resettlement programs, um, but they are able to participate in welcoming refugees through sponsorship. And we are seeing actually in some of the emerging sponsorship programs in places like the UK and Ireland um, that a number of the sponsorship groups are in rural or smaller communities. Um, and I think when people are directly involved in welcoming refugees, it really humanizes um, the refugee issue. So because people can actually know somebody who is a refugee, um, and it also contributes to creating an atmosphere of welcoming communities. That's great. Uh, Sabine, do you want to add on to that or? Yeah, sure. I'll say a couple of things. So, um, yeah, I, I also I don't want to focus on the what might be the the obvious benefit, you know, which is obviously the benefit that's arising to the refugees themselves who are who are finding protection. And I think maybe uh, Craig will talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I also want to talk about 
the the role it has in in community building but also then you know kind of to to scale that out in nation building <laughs> because our nation is made up of communities and so what I, what i think this this is doing uh, this program um and there's there's actually some hard evidence for that is um that that it does contribute over time this is not an immediate uh, effect but over time it it contributes to to creating a more favorable public consensus on refugees um and we know that there are unfortunately many countries right now around the world and i mean uh, canada is not entirely devoid of that you know there's obviously anti immigrant voices in in our society as well but overall you know we have so far avoided this this kind of nativist anti immigrant sentiment that we are seeing on a much larger scale in some other places in in the world and so it's this kind of you know uh, i mean we we we've called the book strangers to neighbors i know we had a lot of conversation around the title and that's what we called it you know and xenophobia and you know anti foreigner sentiment arises from the person being a stranger and the minute they are becoming the neighbor the minute they are becoming a person that we get to know things change and that is a very consistent um a very consistent statement that that many sponsors actually uh, do make and so of course from from my, my and Brian's chapter's perspective the naming uh, ability in particular enhances the sense of community ownership um relative to a model where sponsors do not have so much input over whom they sponsor so it's not just the fact that they get to know the people they sponsor but it's also this the sense of i'm actually having a say you know in the decisions that that my country is making that we're all together making and who is coming in here who are becoming our new neighbors so i think this uh, in particularly uh, strengthens that 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 kind of idea thank you i'll add to that that there is another chapter in the book uh, where the co the lead author is audrey macklin and it's from a research project that i'm also part of where over 500 Syrian sponsors were interviewed and Macklin's chapter in the book is called Kindred Spirits because in it it's analyzed all the sponsors reflections on uh, the sponsored refugees as being connected to their family um, and some of those connections so there's all these different reflections there's also another chapter uh, focusing on the Mennonite Central Committee and their work over years and years to make these connections so that's wonderful Craig I mean, two things. One, one is that. So, just a bit, of, a bit of context for for the for the audience who, who doesn't so much follow like global uh, refugee politics is that less than one percent of refugees in the world uh, get access to the possibility of resettlement every year. Um, it used to be the case that the United States resettled by far the highest proportion, the highest like overall number of refugees per year, around 100,000 refugees per year. Canada resettles, what, it was like 30,000-ish? No? Um, under the Trump administration, that number, it was announced two weeks ago or a week ago, it has steadily declined, just been slashed, and now it's at 15,000 per year. Um, so Canada is now the country that resettles the most refugees. Um, we talked about this earlier. It's not because Canada stepped up and did more. Canada did the same thing and everybody else uh, shirked their responsibilities and left refugees where they are, which is 85% of them in some of the poorest states in the world. Uh, and the average duration of being a refugee right now is 26 years, which means that there's intergenerational refugee populations in the world with no chance of resettlement which again is why you have large scale, a, lot, a big proportion of large scale irregular migration, uh, like people coming on boats uh, to Europe or walking to the US Mexico border, et cetera. So that's like the kind of the big context. And as other players like the US step away from that, Canada completely has the capacity to step up and do more. And Canadians have illustrated that they don't need to be compelled or coerced to step up and do more. They want to do more and they want the avenues to do that. And at the risk of being optimistic about you know, the Canada brand, because um, that's not my brand, um, at the risk of being optimistic about the Canada brand, so Canada has, like Sabine said, so far bucked to this trend 
where uh, of of anti-immigrant, um, you know, far right electoral gains, um, and we can do more. And then providing that example and kind of I don't know, keeping the light actually really matters. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. Canada from the early 2000s is doing more resettlement than we used to. So Sabine, you might be better on these numbers than me, but I think in sort of 2000 to 2010, we were maybe at about a total of 12,000, maybe 15,000 on a good year. So we've kind of doubled our numbers too. But when we're celebrating ourselves and patting ourselves on the back as being the global leader for the past two years, that's really more a reflection of other countries failing and particularly the US. Uh, so Canada has already shown capacity in the last decade to really step up more than it had in the years previous, but also much, um, much more could be done. And so this kind of connects to the next question, which is recognizing that this event is hosted by the Canadian International Council. Part of the CIC's mission is to involve Canadians in defining Canada's role in the world, which is why I pitched to them that we talk about private sponsorship here. And so I'm going to ask my panelists, can you speak to the role that sponsorship plays in this, in defining Canada's role in the world? And I'm going to just leave it to whoever wants to jump in first. So maybe I'll start, Shauna, because um, I think since you're asking this question, we have to we have to uh, acknowledge, you know, a report that was published two years ago, 2018, uh, actually in partnership with with the CIC, Canadian International Council, and it was published by the Environics Institute. And there were a couple of other partners, and so basically in, in that report, um, the the authors are looking, you know, based on based on research on the way in which Canadians are defining um, their role in the world and are defining Canada's role in the world. So it's called the 2018 Canada's World Survey Report and you can you can find that if you search for it um, on Google. And what it found, a previous uh, study had been done 10 years earlier, so 2008. So what the 2018 um, research found was that there was a major shift between uh, 10 years earlier and, and basically the, the research coming on the heels of Operation Syria. And while Canadians had in the past defined their country's place in the world in the context of peacekeeping and foreign aid, by 2018, they actually defined Canada's place in the world as one that welcomes people from elsewhere. And so they said in the report that Canadians now noted that um, multiculturalism and, and the acceptance, acceptance of immigrants was their country's most positive contribution to the world. And that was mentioned unprompted. So there was no question that prompted for it. So unprompted people, um, basically 25% uh, of the survey respondents said that. And that was a number that was four times higher than a decade earlier. So why that has anything to do with uh, private sponsorship is the following. Because the, the researchers looked in particular uh, at, because it came on the heels of Operation Syria, what were the linkages there, you know, with people's involvement in sponsorship. And so there is a special section in the report on on this issue so one in three canadians one in three reported a connection to the 2015-16 syrian refugee sponsorship program either directly or through someone that they knew so seven percent of those surveyed reported that they had actually been directly involved in refugee sponsorship which is also a sky high number and then the others knew someone who had and were somehow involved and of course, the, the report acknowledges that, that it's difficult to establish a direct causal relationship there, right? There's no direct causality, but, but it is, it's a trend and it, it continues. I mean, if you read the news last week, there was another report by Enveronics uh, with some research on how the Canadian public perceives uh, immigration and refugees in general. And this is research that is done more frequently. And again, you know, the research revealed levels of support for immigration that had not been recorded in more than four decades of this type of research. 
So I would, I would argue that, and this is a long-term process, right? Over time, this happens and over time it has an impact. Um, so it's, it's vitally important, uh, not just for the refugees that are finding this protection that is so, so hard to find, but, but for society at large, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, before I let my panelists jump in, I, I, I'll just comment that for me, what I always find so surprising is the welcoming messaging that Canadians speak for refugees who are resettled and sponsored, and yet at the same time, this sort of rejection of asylum seekers. And so the sort of closure of our border with the US. Asylum seekers aren't deemed an essential reason to cross because of the pandemic. Uh, the Canadian federal court recently found that the safe third country agreement with the United States, which requires refugees to make their claims in the United States first and not able, enable them to come to Canada to claim asylum if they arrive in the US, the Federal Court of Canada in July found that decision to be that agreement to be unconstitutional. And yet our federal government has opted to appeal that decision rather than recognize that the US is not a safe country for refugees. So our acceptance of refugees is really strong. And yet there still seems to be some tension between which refugees are being welcomed um, and which are, are being a little not quite seen as refugees in need in the same way. So I always just kind of like to put that tension on it. Uh, but Rachel or Craig, do you have anything you'd like to say? I just wanted to put something, <clears throat> put something on people's radars. Um, there was a question in the Q&A about, um, oh, Sabine wants to answer it. I'll leave it alone. Um, to put something on people's radars is that the, while Canada, um, you know, keeps resettling people, that there's like a very strong disjuncture around uh, Canada's response to refugee and displacement crises and where resettled people come from. Um, so for instance, I'm, I'm working on a project now about Canada's response to displacement in Latin America. Um, so there's as much displacement in Latin America, a little bit less, uh, as there was from the Syrian civil war. Um, yet only 1% of refugees who are resettled to Canada come from Canada's own hemisphere, um, where there are over 5 million people displaced. Um, and there's, as, as people become aware of this, of this uh, process and, and the kind of like national project around resettlement and what private sponsorship means and how people can get involved if they haven't been involved yet. But there, there are like large political contexts involved in this uh, that, that people should, I think, become aware of. Um, and there are some like perverse elements to the way that private sponsorship works. Um, so I work on a project in the Netherlands right now, which is a community sponsorship uh, project that matches people with asylum seekers who are already there. We had one working with government assisted refugees that's still in a, like a functional NGO in Toronto and Ottawa called Together Project. It was with government assisted refugees. Um, th there was this notion after 2015 that everybody wanted a Syrian family. Like, where are my Syrians? Send me some Syrians, give me some Syrians. Um, there are lots of other countries and there are people around the world who have been displaced for decades or more who also require uh, that access to international protection and the chance to live a fulfilling life. And what Rachel was talking about, the, the, the BIVOR model is one, I think is like exceptional and, and kind of, in my opinion, the, w the way it should kind of all move in, 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 in my, in my opinion. So all of this is, all these stories are quite complicated, uh, is, is I guess my, my intervention on that, on that question. Thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful and helpful intervention. And I think Rachel would say, yeah, but the problem with BIVOR is that it doesn't necessarily show its strength of sustainability. Uh, but Rachel, I won't answer for you, although I just did. Um, and I will open it to you to expand on your ideas to this question. Do you need me to repeat the question at this point or are you good? No, I think I'm good. So, um, I mean, one of the interesting things about BVOR is 
So even during the Syrian initiative, there was quite a Syrian focus to it. So there were people who were even waiting for a Syrian family to come on the BVOR list. And so I think that question of, it's a very political decision to identify, oh, we're going to resettle 25,000 Syrians, but what about all the other refugees in the world? Um, but one of the interesting things that happened was that um, people who were initially going to sponsor Syrian refugees um, through the BVOR program, well, at the point they were going to choose a family, there were no Syrians on the list. So they decided to sponsor um, families from other countries. So for example, that's how my group got involved in sponsoring a Somali family from um, Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. We didn't really know much about that refugee situation before, um, but that's what happened. I think the other thing about um, how sponsorship is related to Canada's role in the world is that it gives Canada a credibility to speak globally on resettlement issues. Um, so we've talked about the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, but I think Canada has also shown leadership in other areas. Um, so Canada this year just finished um, as chair of the annual tripartite consultations on resettlement, for example, and that's essentially in intergovernmental meetings to encourage and support and promote resettlement and to discuss best practices among countries and things like that. Um, and there have also been individual Canadians who have um, been quite involved in promoting resettlement on the global scale. Um, so for example, there was someone who was working at Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada and is now leading UNHCR's three-year strategy on resettlement and complementary pathways, so promoting uh, refugee resettlement and sponsorship around the world. That's wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to give it back to Sabine for two reasons. I know she wants to make a comment um, back to Craig and I'll, again, I'll say that we chose the chapters in this book to have a discussion amongst people who don't necessarily see the program the same way because there are lots of different dimensions. And I wrote the conclusion to the book and I tried to bring all these different axes into play to discuss all those tensions. Um, so I'm gonna let Sabina re respond to Craig, but then also we have a question from our um, participants tonight. And the question is, does Canada's accepting um, refugee sponsorship program, is Canada accepting refugees through the sponsorship program during the COVID-19 pandemic? And then the follow the second part of that question is, is if yes, from which country? And I think that actually that second part also speaks to something that Sabine, you mentioned briefly, but that there is a global reach to this program. So I'll hand it back to you. Great, thank you. So thank you, Craig, for, for mentioning uh, our own hemisphere and you know Latin America, Central America. Um, it, it's actually really interesting. And I, as you were talking, I was starting to reflect on that. And I said, I have never much thought about that. So of course, naming, you know, means that our program is sponsor driven. So yeah, we, we can critique the government on that, you know, in regard to the refugees that they are selecting to bring to Canada. But keeping in mind that right now we have two thirds privately sponsored refugees arriving versus uh, one third from the government assisted. And it's very interesting, actually, that um, in, in my own practice, you know, in my own sponsorship practice, I don't get people who want to sponsor people from our own hemisphere. So it's as simple as that. It's not like the government wouldn't look at that as long as someone meets the refugee definition we can name them you know we have that ability but we just i think collectively across the country uh, don't see many sponsors coming forward that are suggesting um, refugees from that part of the world which is really interesting actually thank you for for kind of getting me to think about that um, in regard to that question that has come in in the chat box, so um, whether Canada accepts refugee sponsorship uh, sponsorships right now during COVID-19. So uh, there's kind of two things I want to say. Uh, so one is that yes, we can still uh, submit applications for sponsorship. So that is continuing unabated. There has been no pause on that except for the BVOR program uh, that Rachel has discussed that is on pause, but the named one is not. But of course, where we have the real problem right now is with resettling people actually coming in. That is not because of um, you know anything particular in immigration. It's because of the border closure. So uh, the border is basically closed, as we all know, 
to most uh, populations, to most people uh, that are foreign nationals, with some exceptions that are starting to kind of loosen up a little bit now about family connections. And for refugees, unfortunately, only those can come in that were already approved to come to Canada by the 18th of March. And this is something, you know, as we go forward, I mean, we in uh, my civil society context, uh, we are already looking at the, uh, and saying, well, shouldn't we be asking the government to change that? Because what's the problem? You know, the refugees that are coming in right now that have come in over the summer, um, they go into quarantine just like any Canadian or returning permanent resident. Um, and then they start their new life in Canada two weeks later <laughs> than they would have, right? And during those two weeks, they are well taken care of by their sponsors. They are either in a hotel situation, sometimes they are in private accommodations. So what, what's the problem? Why not give refugees, you know, uh, their, their permanent resident visas if they are otherwise ready to come and, and let them in? So that's one challenge that, that I'm grappling with right now. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. And I'll say... Other chapters in the book speak to some of these tensions in different ways as well. There's a chapter um, by Megan Bradley and Kate Doon. Uh, Megan's a political science professor at McGill University. And what their chapter talks about is, again, the global refugee context and why should the focus be on those refugees that are targeted for resettlement in terms of that much bigger population of refugees in need. And then there's a chapter by a philosopher, Patty Lennard, who asks really critically, on what basis do we decide who deserves our protection? And how do we make those choices? And how do we weigh? And does knowledge of a Canadian give you some extra benefit to come? And so we have all these questions and all these sort of challenges. And in terms of the global reach, sponsorship opens it to that. But if, as Sabine says, the sponsors aren't thinking in that global reach to these the Southern Hemisphere or other places where they want to um, focus their attention. I know when my friends who had never really thought about refugee sponsorship approached me in 2016 to do a sponsorship, my response was, I'm happy to do one, but I, I would rather not sponsor a Syrian family because they're getting so much attention. And so we sponsored a family from Colombia. Um, and then that Colombian family was in a lot of language programs and other things with a lot of Syrians um, and felt very alone. And so there's a lot of different questions and a lot of different challenges, but I'm going to move now to our third of four questions, just in terms of it, in the interest of time. We have another 40 minutes, um, but I would like to get a bit more generating Q&A happening at the same time. So question number three, um, we're already sort of talking about these tensions. But what are some of the other tensions or challenges within Canada's sponsorship program that are sometimes hidden? And can they be addressed? And Craig, do you want to go first this time? Um, thanks. Um, I, I think that there's a couple of things there. I think that probably Sabine can talk better about the interpersonal dynamics and things like sponsorship breakdown and what that looks like because she works on that on the day to day. In terms of the how well the Canadian model presents itself as a model for other states to take on um, what we talked about around additionality. So resettling an additional number of people over and above the quotas that they've set themselves, that states have set themselves, or in the in the instance of the European Union, there are EU quotas and state quotas as well. And that's that a lot of the evidence around the relationship between private sponsorship and integration, so that's like incorporation of people into labor markets or less tangible things like sense of belonging, social isolation, et cetera, in Canada, we have something like a natural experiment, but not quite um, in the difference in integration rates and overall outcomes between government assisted refugees and privately sponsored refugees. And there are, again, like anecdotal evidence and hypotheses that it could be the social networks and the social capital that they have access to that somehow is the the, the, the kind of causal 
explanation of why their integration is better. But we don't actually know that, right? Canada doesn't set up its policies and its resettlement policies or even its immigration policies uh, in a way that lends itself well to causal uh, explanations. Rather, we do like post hoc evaluations and compare immigrants against one another and against native born populations. That doesn't fly in places like Europe. European policymakers say to us something like, that's a very nice story that you guys are telling in Canada, but we have real problems to deal with here, like a million people showing up in a year and Viktor Orban winning an election and potentially Marine Le Pen winning an election. Uh, and we have to deal with that. Um, and we have all of these member states whose governments are tying anti-immigrant sentiment with anti-EU sentiment. So we have much bigger uh, political fish to fry than your really nice story that 30% of Canadians have some kind of personal connection to this and Canada is a great place to be. So just to, just to round that off, I think, it, I think that, the, that the Canadian government needs to think about how it presents this story uh, to the world in a way that allows policymakers in other places to say, okay, we're going to take this risk. We're going to go with this gamble because we now have evidence that it works and we think that we can transfer it here. There's a lot more I could say about the hidden things, but that's, that's, that's one of them from an international relations standpoint. That's great. Okay, let's go from the international to the rural. Rachel, do you have any reflections on this? Yeah, um, I guess, well, in the rural context, there are a variety of opportunities and challenges, but one of the big um, tensions with the uh, blended visa office referred model is the question of privatization. And Shauna's work has looked a lot at this question um, in different contexts, but the BVOR program was really criticized from the beginning for privatizing government responsibilities. And the private sponsorship program has also been criticized for um, privatizing government responsibilities, especially as the number of privately sponsored refugees has gone up and risen to be basically double um, the number of government assisted refugees. And so there's a question of kind of violating this principle that we call additionality. And sponsorship agreement holders are also struggling a little bit um, with managing all these sponsorships that they're now expected to um, manage and actually monitor in a much um, more intensive way than they ever were before. And so there's this question of financial and settlement support shifting to sponsors. Um, but at the same time, um, private sponsorship is not fully private. And that's important to recognize, especially for other countries like in Europe or New Zealand or wherever that might be potentially considering a private sponsorship program is there's a lot of um, government infrastructure and other kinds of supports that are needed to support a, a private sponsorship program. So the government processes privately sponsored refugees, they provide settlement support like language classes, and then other public services like healthcare, education, whatever. And so you need um, strong government support for a successful private sponsorship program. Now, government resettlement programs also rely on volunteers, so they're not fully public either. Sometimes we make this false dichotomy, I think, between, well, there's private sponsorship and public resettlement, but everything's more a little bit in between. It's more of a spectrum. Um, but I think in terms of addressing this question of privatization and this potential problem, one of the things that the government could really do is um, provide support for capacity building for sponsorship agreement holders um, and other organizations that are really working in this field um, to make sure that they are um, really capable of meeting the challenge of these rising sponsorship numbers. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Sabine. 
Sure. So I'm just going to pick up some of these themes, especially what, what Rachel has mentioned. Uh, I mean, I could talk, we could have a whole evening talking about challenges in this program. Okay. Like there's no shortage of those challenges. And in my work uh, with the, with the SAW council representing, you know, over 120 sponsorship agreement holder organizations, we have a, a standing committee essentially with the government, with government officials uh, to deal with challenges by and large. And, and that is, you know, one of the challenges in all of these programs that essentially rests on a successful public private partnership between the government that's ultimately you know has the right to admit people to its territory or not and and the private sponsors that are basically like Rachel was saying supposed to get increasingly higher numbers of uh, refugees to to land in Canada and thus help Canada fulfill you know its immigration levels plan um, which which shows more and more uh, resettled refugees which is then obviously like we were talking about earlier uh, something the government um, showcases, you know, as as a Canadian achievement, but um, let me let me mention one of what we currently uh, sort of in civil society and in, in the practitioner community see as as the biggest challenge. And Rachel alluded to that a little bit uh, when she talked about you know increasing monitoring of of the program, increasing expectations around what what that work looks like that that sponsors do with resettled refugees. So. There is an increasing level of uh, an expectation of professionalism in this program, um, and it, it it entirely misses the point um, of this the family linkage of many of these sponsorships, which of course goes back to the naming. Because whom do sponsors name? Well, by and large, family members. There are some, you know, where friends are being named or or people that uh, some people have come to know while they were traveling somewhere. We have those as well, but very, very often a very high percentage of our program uh, is family links. And, and you know, if you, if you think about people coming in that are aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, to people that are already living here, you can't treat these people in the same way as refugees that are being brought in, you know, through a UN referral and that the government takes responsibility for and where there are, you know, policies and procedures in place that contracted and paid agencies um, are implementing. But that's exactly what the government has done. The government has over the past two years basically said that all the policies that apply to government assisted refugees are basically equally applied to privately sponsored refugees and completely ignores the fact that uh, you know they are in in relationships with their families here in Canada so anyways I'll, I'll stop it here because <laughs> I could talk about this for hours but it is the biggest um, issue right now in the program the fact that there is no official acknowledgement there is no such thing as family linked sponsorships in legislation you know in policies and yet that is the program yes and in my in my other book in my the book that i did write crossing laws border that's actually one of my recommendations that i would love to see a separately a separate channel for family linked sponsorship so that it could be treated differently, but so that we could also identify how much of what we're doing is family and how much of we're doing is high need protection in the way that BVOR tries to do in the way that GAR is a set for, but as we move more to PSR, privately, private sponsorship of refugees, so we know how much of that is family and we have a more clear understanding of what's being done in which program that becomes really blurred right now. Craig, you have a comment? Well, yeah, on, on, on that note, like my concern is that, and Michelle Rempel's online right now. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this, but my concern is that, is that then people on the right of the political spectrum then say something along the lines of, okay, this is like a, this is some this is some kind of like sneaky program for additional family reunification that people that that that's always been my concern about the recognizing the de facto family reunification aspect of private sponsorship but not talking about it as openly or codifying and i don't know what shauna and and if it, what everybody thinks of that and that's that's always been a concern of mine and why i don't talk about it in 
Well, and I, I think in some, I think that's a fair concern. And yet my concern is as we move to double the amount of PSR as government and as the BVOR program doesn't seem to achieve what it's meant to do, which is to reorient to protection, um, that we're not, we're taking on this cape of humanitarian role in the world. Um, and yet we're not addressing some of the highest need protection of refugees that's out there. And I, a part of me and I, my background is I used to work for UNHCR and do the referrals. And so I get conscious of how much need there is that isn't being addressed while Canada claims they are doing so much. And yet, as Sabine talks about, also not really acknowledging what they're doing and therefore not supporting and facilitating what they're doing very clearly. So I think there's, these are all the challenges. I don't know if anyone else has comments. And then we have a couple of questions that I want to get to. Anyone else want to jump in there? Okay, I'm going to ask one of the questions we have in our Q&A then before we move on. Um, and I think all of you can probably talk to this, uh, but Jenny has asked about um, if there are interests by countries elsewhere other than Europe to take on Canada's model. Um, and the listed questions are Australia, New Zealand, um, and Asian countries. I will say in the book, we have a chapter on Australia, and I'm just going to read the title. It's from some Aus Australian scholars. And their chapter is called Private Humanitarian Sponsorship, Searching for the Community in Australia's Community Refugee Sponsorship Program. And that chapter is by Anthea Vogel, Khan Hong, and Asher Hirsch. And so Australia does have a similar model, but it's complicated and in the chapter challenged for a lot of ways that it isn't actually modeling um, much community um, assistance. But I don't know if Craig or Sabina want to address this question about other countries that have been interested. So yeah, there there are a number. Um, mostly the countries have been in Europe, as far as I know. Um, but there is, uh, for example, Argentina uh, has been quite interested, and so they seem to be starting up something. And I'm I'm understanding that, and I'm I'm not entirely you know up with the the latest on this, but I'm understanding that. Uh, most of the resettlement they are doing or hoping to do is supposed to be through sponsorship. So again, you know, which gets back to our question of additionality and, you know, what kind of, what kind of additionality is there in a sponsorship program if this becomes sort of, you know, the, the basic premise of resettlement and a country is willing to consider resettlement uh, if it goes through sponsorship. Then on the other hand, of course, we can also argue and say, well, but if they don't do this, right, and then those refugees will wouldn't get to safety. And this is the challenge and the struggle we always have with the additionality question, right? Um, are, we, are we saying this is, this is not uh, valuable or this is not, you know, how it should be done? Um, we, we would always like to see governments do at least as much. So it is actually, you know, no more than, than matching. So there, there's, there's a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, at best. And so that, that government should do at least as much as, as private, uh, private citizens are doing. But, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think I, I, I should be criticizing what, what the Argentinian government has, has decided to do here. And I understand that the, the communities there are quite, uh, quite keen, you know, and they, they want to get started. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Craig, you might have other thoughts on that. And just to note that New Zealand also started a pilot project based off of Canada's sponsorship model. I'm not exactly sure um, what the status of that project is now, but they were testing out um, something quite similar. Craig, do you have anything to add? I, I do briefly, but um, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me properly? We can hear you fine. Okay. Um, yeah, a, bi a big pushback from um, and Sabina. Were you and I together in the Hague? Is that where? Yeah, that's where it was. Um, a big pushback from civil society organizations in Europe is that 
the Canadian model smells a lot to them like American neoliberalism um, in the sense that they say we have robust welfare states. Um, those robust welfare states should um, provide the or provide at least the financial side of this, but also in a place like the Netherlands, for example, where everyone from the time they move out of their parents' house till they finish their third master's degree lives in community, in, in, in state-sponsored housing, which can be quite nice housing, actually. Um, and then the notion that a resettled and very vulnerable person will come into the country and rely on what a lot of them see as the charity of private citizens. Um, a, that additional financial burden of the Canadian model seems very strange and foreign, but the fact that the welfare state there wouldn't take up that burden uh, is, 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 I think that there's like, it's, it's political, but it's also some like, somewhat like morally problematic. Uh, in at least in the Northern European, Western European places with robust welfare states. So that, that's, that's one thing to think of. Um, the other thing to think of is that in, at least in the Latin American context where I know that the GRSI had originally focused in, at, at one level, but I haven't heard of anything really coming from that for, other than the, the Argentine case, um, is that it's again the European answer, which is like, well, we've got a lot to deal with already. Um, and this additionality is, is the problem in itself, which the Global Compact uh, on Refugees recognizes that addition at, none, of, none of it works, whether it's host state development money or resettlement, none of that works if it's just repackaged old programming in the language of new initiatives, and it has to be something new and in addition to existing programming. So those are things to keep in mind. And just my last point there is that all of, all of this stuff aside, the criticisms, the problems, the contradictions, and the tensions, letting the, letting the perfect be the enemy of the good is something that Canadians excel at. Um, and there's a lot of good to be learned from the Canadian model. Um, and we shouldn't think that it has to be exported wholesale. So that's, I guess, my, my last comment on that. Thank you. And I will just add that um, in terms of thinking as the Global Compact does and seeing um, sponsorship as a complementary pathway and reception in these countries, the other thing that I always get concerned that Canada does is um, use resettlement as the moral justification for the closure of borders or the increasing of obstacles for access to other protection. So in the moment, and I come at it from a really different perspective than Craig does, but I, I got ner very nervous when the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative started pushing to give European countries this opening to sponsor refugees, because I thought in a way that when they were already feeling overwhelmed with refugees, it was a nice way to show humanitarianism and welcoming while actually closing off most access to protection in the country. And there's always that double-edged sword with it, which is what is so challenging because it does offer spaces and it does offer protection and all these positives happen. But depending on the government in play and depending on their interests and incentives, these rationales can play out differently. Um, I guess we're on to our final question and we've got about 15 minutes left. I see no open questions right now. Um, so I'm going to ask the qu last question is a simple one, but we need to address it here. Uh, the book was written prior to uh, the pandemic. It was the pandemic had already um, sort of presented itself as we did our final edits and Jeffrey Cameron and I as the editors do acknowledge it um, at the beginning of the book and that it was going into print at the time of a much different reality from where we all began. And so we now have this book that is full of insight on the sponsorship model, but as being talked about right now, there's 
there's some operating, but we're in a very different um, place in terms of access to our country for any resettlement. So to my panelists, what is your impression on how the coronavirus has impacted refugee sponsorship? And how do you envision the program moving forward when we have that space and opportunity and health and safety to see that? And anyone who wants to jump in can. Well, I'll start by saying, yes, the private sponsorship of refugees program has restarted in a limited way. As Shauna said, the blended visa office referred program is totally suspended until further notice. So we have no idea when it will actually restart and when it will start matching families again. So the whole future of that program is really a big question mark right now. Um, and it was already struggling to recruit sponsors before COVID-19 hit. And I think, um, kind of moving post pandemic or through the pandemic, I think it's going to become even more difficult to recruit sponsors to um, sponsor strangers or recruit sponsors who have no previous connection to refugees. Um, because, well, first of all, I think people and communities are dealing with a lot of their own issues. And so people tend to become a little more insular, look at what are the needs in my own little community rather than what are the global needs. And that's not you know, always a bad thing, but it does have implications for sponsorship. Um, and people are facing financial challenges um, and other challenges. So I think it's um, going to be hard for someone with no other connection to refugees to say, oh, this is a great time for me to sponsor a refugee family right now. Um, and this is something I now want to get involved with. I think family reunification through the private sponsorship program will continue because there's always that demand to bring families together. Thank you, Rachel. That's really a key worry. Craig, Sabine? Maybe I'll pick up on what um, Rachel said. I, I fully agree with you, Rachel. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm not entirely clear. Um, I mean, those of you working on sponsorships are not entirely clear why no matches are possible. You know, why, uh, what are all the underlying reasons? Because I, I think if there's a will, there's a way. I mean, I can tell you, for example, we were able to take on sponsorship under the joint assistance program, which is another specialized program um, to blending of of money from government and settlement support from sponsors. And today I got notification that this family will arrive, you know, like uh, even from a part of the world where we were told there was even no travel. So uh, sometimes, you know, we wonder a little bit about the kinds of things that are being said and what is actually possible if, if um, yeah, if there is a need for a family. But what I would say more from the, from the named perspective, the family link perspective is that in a nutshell, I think the pandemic has, has strengthened the resolve for many sponsors and family members who see their family members that are living as refugees falling on even harder times now, right? Because what the pandemic has done in those other countries where, where people are living as refugees, uh, it has often shut down the informal economy that people are working in. Uh, it has taken away the livelihoods of people. Some people are literally um, in the beginning shut in their house, shut, locked in their houses. So there was military standing outside that those were some of the reports I got military standing by the front door and they couldn't actually leave the house. So it's become very desperate for many refugees, even more desperate than it already was. So there's, there's a resolve to sponsor uh, family members and, and sponsors are coming to us but there's weakened capacity in the system, right? And so there's a number of, of reasons why there is weakened capacity. So uh, I mean, the broader, in the broader scheme, obviously the border closures, you know, the, the visa offices are not working at, at capacity, we're being told, but also sponsors are experiencing difficulties due to their own economic situation. So there's the economic downturn here. People have lost their jobs, you know, people are struggling more. The family members here that want to sponsor are also sending more money abroad now <laughs> to sponsor other displaced family members uh, because they they have lost their livelihood. So it's kind of a vicious, a vicious cycle. Um, if people come in, settlement supports are getting more complex because of the quarantine conditions. And then there's uh, lots of changes and lots of challenges in, in services, you know, accessing services once people do come in. Um, so yeah, so th those are just some of the challenges. I think, like you said, Rachel, I think uh, 
it, it will continue because the demand, you know, is there. There's always more demand than we can ever resettle to Canada in, in the sponsor referred um, program. But what is happening right now, the longer that border is closed, you know, the more that backlog of these uh, cases that are unprocessed in the system is growing. And I think the gains that had been made just before the pandemic struck in terms of processing times, it, it was getting quite good in some of the visa offices for sure those gains are being lost you know there's there's a big backlog developing and i mean we have no idea when that border will will open and so i think this is something i think we all you know as we advocate as as refugee advocates need to seriously consider uh, do we want to ask the government you know why why that needs to be uh, in place i mean we have heard about hockey players that were allowed to come in last night we heard on the news there have been executives of certain companies that came into the country and didn't even have to go into quarantine. All refugees that have come in, certainly that I'm responsible for, have quarantined 14 days. They've done their thing, you know, like every other good citizen. So why is the border closed to them? Greg, do you have anything to add? Um. Not, not in the Canadian context. Um, I, I just know that in the European context that there is, I'm sure that people here, if they're interested in this webinar, they're, they're familiar with what's been going on in uh, Lesbos and Greece in the Mariah refugee camp and the fires there, which, which is just a symptom of um, what's been going on in Europe and trying to keep people uh, at bay. Um, the projects that I work with in the Netherlands and then potentially now in Germany, well, not related to the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, are pushing now for governments in Europe to do more, uh, to understand that there are people and community members and community groups who are, who are ready to step up and do more. And just to echo, you know, what, what Sabine was saying is that the government here is is quite responsive. Um, it seems to me when there is too much dissonance between its uh, the reputation that it's built for itself around private sponsorship and the reality. Um, a few well placed op eds and uh, and some some back channel conversations can have a lot of impact. Um, and if people people are concerned with, you know, again, this like completely ludicrous thing that we're more interested in hockey than, than, than people who have been displaced for a, a decade. Um, again, I'm sorry, Canadians out of Toronto, I don't care about hockey, but that, the, that, 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 that there, is a, there is a strong relationship between public sentiment and, and government policy, at least around this issue area, it seems to me. Um, and that people can do something and that, and that we have that capacity in Canada. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And while Craig was talking, I put a link in the chat for everyone from the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers and a new campaign that they've started on why refugee travel is essential in this moment. And it's a powerful campaign. They have some videos that I actually showed my university students that seem to affect them more than any of the other um, or advocacy that I was trying to put forward. So if you're looking for tools or understanding, that's there. Uh, we're nearing the end of time, but there was one further question that I just want to address because I think it's an interesting question and it's challenging. So the question from is, is there a difference in how refugees who are government sponsored versus those who are privately sponsored integrate? And does one group fare better than the other? And I'm going to start this, but then my panelists can come in. What When people ask me this question, my first um, answer is always that it's comparing apples and oranges. And part of that comes in from everything the panelists have talked about, that uh, government resettlement tends to come from UNHCR referrals of prioritized protection cases. Whereas uh, private sponsorship, when it's named, it still fits within the parameters of 
persons in need of protection. So there's still very clear criteria on who can come in through that program and absolutely everyone who comes in needs protection. Um, but they might not be in the same level of vulnerability as some of the refugees referred through the government program. So sometimes you have very different connections. Um, if you're coming with those familial supports that the PSR program often brings, you have those additional be benefits to help your integration. There might be different timelines in refugee camps. There might be different education levels. And so there are now, particularly with the arrivals of the Syrians, when another aspect of the Syrian resettlement that is so interesting to me as an academic is the government put a lot more money into funding academic research on the arrival of these refugees. And so what you're getting now is a bit of a weighted um, knowledge base on this particular group of refugees compared to other refugee arrivals. And so it's a wealth of very valuable knowledge, but it's a little, um, it doesn't address some of the lacking information on other broader refugee groups. So I'll leave it with that and see if anyone else wants to jump in. Yeah, I would agree with Shauna that um, it's just so hard to compare the two groups because a refugee who is privately sponsored is much more likely to speak English or French, much more likely to have a higher level of education, um, and the list goes on. So um, it's difficult. So when you see some, uh, and there are some studies now showing that at least early on, um, privately sponsored refugees have some better economic outcomes. Um, but then over time, these same studies show that they basically come together. So over time, the earnings and the percentage of people who are employed um, start to come together. And so maybe in the short term, privately sponsored refugees go to work faster, for example. Um, but that's not even always necessarily a good thing um, because the first year is supposed to be a time to learn the language and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, in the end, over time, their outcomes are relatively similar. And then you can think to a lot of these studies pretty narrowly focus on like participation in the labor market and things like that. But integration can be about so many other things like sense of belonging and things like that. And for those kinds of things, um, there is uh, evidence that both government um, assisted refugees and privately sponsored refugees um, integrate relatively well. I, I couldn't agree more, Rachel. I think the real problem with this whole argument with the integration is that uh, integration, the way it is, it is measured uh, by government is very narrowly defined around economic indicators. So it's basically, I mean, you've almost named them all. Those, those are the things that are being looked at generally, right? It's what, what's your income? How, how soon do you work? Uh, how many are in social income assistance? Uh, that kind of thing, right? Th th those are basically the indicators. I, I have not seen, and maybe, you know, you work more as academics. I call myself a hobby academic. I'm mostly a practitioner. Um, maybe you know studies. I haven't seen any that define integration much more broadly and take into consideration indicators that are not as easily quantifiable, right? I mean, obviously, the reason why those indicators are used is because it's more easy to measure. You know, there's dollars behind that. You can you can very clearly measure that. And I think we need to we need to get beyond that because integration is so much more. You know, a person can feel deeply connected to the new land where they have arrived and and yet, you know, uh, take five years before they really can think about uh, becoming, you know, employed, participating in the labor market uh, because of the many obstacles that, that, that you've referred to, Rachel. So I think that needs a whole new rethink how we understand uh, a person's integration. Thank you. Craig, do you have anything to add or? I, I, I think those were great. I, I, I mean, it's a good thing that the the bar for evidence uh, for for people who are going through these processes is not as high as that of behavioral economic economists. So that's that's all I would say. I think um, 
when I, when I teach immigration and refugee law together, one of the things I always point out to students is that when you're talking about asylum seekers who cross a border and say, I am a refugee, the only question really is protection. And when you do immigration um, of economic immigrants, the question is, what are they going to provide to the country and how will they build and integrate? And when you're doing resettlement, you really end up straddling these two programs because you're doing both refugee protection, but then there is this immigration aspect to it. And particularly with the private sponsorship mo uh, program, you put on this 12 month time frame on it. So in some work I'm doing, we're calling that the temporal arc. So this time frame in which you have to achieve this integration, which is challenging in itself, um, even with all the very real and true challenges of what integration means, what success means on arrival. Um, so that was a wonderful question, Beatrice, to end us on. Thank you for that. We are two minutes to time, and I'm not sure, Jason, but I think our, we might just get kicked off at that point. Uh, I might be wrong on that. But I really want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. It's a, it's a Friday night. Um, not that there's that many options on what to do in these strange pandemic days, but still there were other things you could have done with your evening. So I appreciate so greatly your care and interest in this topic and joining us tonight. And I thank my panelists for their expertise and their energy and just their broad um, understanding of this topic. And again, there are only three of a total of 31 contributors to this book who all brought different knowledge. And there's just, I, as someone who's been working on this for about 15 years in different areas, it was so, it was way more exciting to edit a book um, than to write my own book because I get all this extra knowledge and perspective and energy from really wonderful people. So a huge thank you to my panelists, Rachel, Sabine, and Craig for joining us tonight as well. Um, Robert, is there anything we need to end with with CIC to do farewells? Yes, uh, I guess uh, I should say some thank yous to you and the panels as well. Thank you, Shada, for uh, offering to pull this activity together for us. Uh, Yes, we don't typically choose a Friday night, but hey, what the hell? So here we are on a Friday night. Uh, I think at the uh, at the peak, we had about 30 people online, including the panelists and those of us at the CIC who feel kind of obliged to be here. But nonetheless, I think it was a great event. Uh, if the attendees learned half of what I learned, they learned a hell of a lot. So that's a good thing, I think. Uh, I don't know how many of them were here under, uh, you know, under some sort of academic duress from their from their professors, but you know, you know that happens. Um, I should mention to the uh, to the assembled masses that our next event will be on Saturday, the twenty fourth of October. We're running two panels uh, related to Canada's relations with the African continent. Uh, we're running a panel in the morning and a panel in the afternoon, and information about both of those events can be found on the CIC webpage under the events calendar and on the CIC Winnipeg Facebook page, uh, if you want to go look for that. And, uh, of course, it's been distributed uh, by our uh, by members of the executive and to our friends and followers on email and to other folks around town. Um, and it's open to anybody who wants to attend. Uh, and that's, I think that's what we've got for tonight, folks. It was a really interesting discussion. Like I said, I learned a lot, which is part of what these things are all about as far as I'm concerned. As much as I have a passion for foreign policy, it's really cool to, you know, listen to people who know what they're talking about, talk about topics that I don't know anything about. So, uh, so thank you, Craig, Sabine, and Rachel for joining us tonight. Uh, it must be getting pretty late for Rachel. Uh, yeah, it's